everyone. Good morning, Europe. Um, good evening, Banda, Indonesia. We have people from Bali. I think some people from Banda, yeah. And myself, in um, I'm based in Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia right now. It's under lockdown still. So um, today's webinar is organized by um, Luminotion, a social enterprise um, based in Indonesia, co-founded by myself. My name is Elsa and my partner, Mareka. And also one of the co-hosts here, we have Safira from Bali. No, actually she's from Banda, a true yeah. Bandanese, yeah. So um, today's topic will be coral restoration. Um, I'm going to introduce the speaker for today, um, Dr. Maraika. So Dr. Maraika studied biology in Wurzburg University, Germany. Did I pronounce it right, Maraika? Wurzburg, right? <laughs> yeah. And completed her thesis in the International Research and Study Program game at Geomar Kiel. For this, she spent six months doing research at Bogor Agriculture Institute in Indonesia. Um, then she then conducted her PhD research also in Bogor, in the West Java province, studying the impacts of eutrophication and hypoxia on Asian green mussels, and obtained her doctoral degree in marine science in 2016 from Kiel University, Germany. Since 2018, she is the director of Luminotion. Um, Luminotion focuses a lot on education on marine biology and marine environment. And since August 2020, she is also a postdoctoral researcher at Ruhr University Bochum in Germany. So Marika is dedicated, very dedicated to marine conservation. She is not only the co-founder of Luminotion, she is also the co-founder of non-profit organizations called Bandasi, and also part of the one of the foundation in Indonesia called Yayasan Cahaya Samudra Indonesia. Indonesia. So um, with this, I hand over the speaker to Marika. Please, Marika. Yeah, thank you, Elsa. Today's topic is new achievements in coral restorations. And uh, I selected this topic because I think it's not only of interest to um, scientists, but especially to the diving community. And yeah, this, these are you, these are the people that we would like to reach with this webinar. So not only scientists, but divers or anyone with a passion for the ocean. Um, if you hear the word coral restoration, you probably have an association and which so association you have might depend a lot on when you started diving. When I prepared uh, these slides, I asked Tuta, if you hear coral restoration, what do you think about it? And he said, oh, I'm thinking about these metal frame structures that are put into the sea. So this association is probably because he had his peak diving career, I'd say, in uh, the early 2000s. Um, and that's when this method was really popular. Popular. If you ask someone else, like Vira or Nielo, or yeah, even me, uh, we would probably think about art structures underwater or um, hanging tree structures or coral nurseries. So um, yeah, coral restoration is a topic that has been going on for 40 years, for four decades, and um, it changed a lot. There were many attempts and many successful or less successful trials. And now lately it has all been summed up um, in a review and yeah, the summary of all these experiences I would like to share with you today. So today I will present uh, these three scientific papers. Um, the first one, Coral Restoration, a Systematic Review of Current Methods, Successes, Failures, and Future di Directions from um, Lisa Bostrom-Einersen and 
co-authors um, is a rare view that is a really good overview, really good summary of the whole topic. And then the other two by De La Cruz and Harrison are case studies of a quite new technique. But first of all, what is ecosystem restoration? By definition, by the Society for Ecological Rest Restoration, International Science and Policy Working Group, it means the process of assisting the recovery of an ecosystem that has been degraded, damaged, or destroyed. And you now saw this little sharky swimming through for those who are joining for the first time. <clears throat> that means that the key word it's carrying uh, will be put in the chat and will be made available as our um, scientific term dictionary. So ecosystem restoration has been explored a lot in the terrestrial world, so in land ecosystem, but in the marine environment, it has been more um, yeah, trial and error, many attempts, but it's, it's less well explored. You can distinguish between passive restoration and active restoration. Passive restoration means that an ecosystem that was impacted gets restored by excluding the source of impact. So for example, if the impact was um, yeah, pollution by an industry or nutrient input through agriculture, then you would remove the cause of degradation and uh, wait for or hope for the uh, ecosystem to recover to its original state. So this is passive restoration. On the other hand, um, active restoration is what maybe most of you think about when you think about coral restoration. That means um, actively adding uh, something to an ecosystem to bring it back to its original state or to increase biodiversity and so on. So there are actually many different reasons why to conduct coral restoration. And these reasons should always be uh, also explored first and uh, there should always be a good aim or a good goal why restoration is conducted. Um, a recent paper from 2019 by Bayraktar of that I looked at all the scientific literature out there and also at some gray literature. And they found that the main um, reason for coral restoration was improving the approach and answering questions. So the main reason so far has been research um, that was just looking at how can methods be improved and less at, uh, so this was not a reason of actually restoring large areas of ecosystem, but more like perfectionizing the techniques. The second most common reason was restoring after environmental impact. So if a storm happened in the reef or if bleaching occurred or any other cause that was like a one-time cause, restoring the ecosystem to bringing it back to its original state. After that, um, the next common reason was biodiversity enhancement. So bringing back a species that had been lost, for example, increasing biodiversity, species diversity. Um, another reason could be um, improving the reef for maintaining more fish uh, biomass. So um, for example, assisting in fish aggregation to yeah, make, make an ecosystem more beneficial for fisheries. And yeah, a few studies had biodiversity offset or social reasons as their goals. Biodi biodiversity offset means that uh, by doing something good to one ecosystem, we are paying back for something bad that we might have 
done to the environment in a different way. So kind of paying, kind of paying back um, in one ecosystem of what was done bad in another way, like paying uh, for carbon emission substitutes when flying, that would be an example. And um, social reasons can be educational purposes, for example, or raising awareness in the community. The scientific approaches, but there is a huge number of case studies that were done by the private sector. So these are either um, organizations, volunteer organizations or dive centers. And a lot of them um, had attempts of coral restorations. And for them, the main goals were, for example, improving attractiveness of a dive site or raising awareness or yeah, bringing people, making people actively involved, putting hands on and uh, increasing the fascination for, for the ocean. And um, I think this is a really, really large amount of um, attempts and it's really difficult to put these together in numbers. And yeah, the problem with these attempts is also that not always they were including um, scientists. So lots of valuable information that was probably gathered in there is not available to the science community. And um, yeah, it's harder for other people who like to do restoration to learn from this. And one really, really important thing to think about before someone attempts restoration and this is especially important for um, yeah, those studies done by dive centers or volunteer organizations. It doesn't help to put more corals into a reef that is degraded and that is suffering from a current stress. We have to make sure that the cause of degradation is eliminated first. So if um, yeah, we, are, we know uh, this um, coral reef experiences permanent input of pollution, it doesn't make sense to plant new corals. We first have to stop the pollutants from coming in. Common causes or reasons for reef degradation uh, overfishing, um, destructive fishing, so overfishing, the problem about overfishing is that once the, the fish community that is natural to a reef and that keeps the reef healthy and in shape, for example, by feeding on algae that would grow on corals, once this community is gone, corals will not survive anymore because they will be covered in algae or destructive fishing methods such as dynamite fishing or pulling a net through the reef will destroy the reef directly. Um, eutrophication, which is the input of too many nutrients from uh, human feces, for example, or from agriculture, putting too many nutrients into the sea this will also cause algae to bloom and uh, corals won't have a chance anymore. Uh, sedimentation, uh, which happens if there are building activities on land and then sediments like sand or silt will get into the water, will cover corals and with this will um, yeah, more or less suff suffocate corals, will prevent them from living healthy. Pollution is another big problem that is increasing. Pollution can be because of plastic waste getting into the ocean or industrial waste um, and all kinds of other chemical factors that can destroy coral reefs. And then we have two um, factors that are related to climate change. It's the warming of the ocean. This is often associated to um, El Nino a weather event that happens every few years. 
which brings periods of warm water and um, causes corals to bleach, or storms that are also increasingly happening um, in the last years with preceding climate change. So there's a lot of reasons for reef degradation, where if you find that these are the reason for a reef suffering, a reef that you would like to restore, that has to have to be eliminated first. So if any of these reasons, overfishing, destructive fishing, eutrophication, sedimentation, and pollution are the reason for reef degradation, make sure that they are eliminated first before you start with um, restoration. And then these other two, ocean warming and storms, they are an exception. So if a storm happened, um, it's unlikely that another storm will happen in that extent very soon again, or an El Nino event that might bleach or kill some of the corals, but not all. Um, then you can directly go ahead and start with reef restoration. So for those who did not attend the last session, just a quick reminder of what uh, the coral life cycle actually is, so what corals are, before we talk more about the specific um, restoration techniques. Um, corals are animals, and these animals form structures, calcium carbonate, so limestone structures in the ocean. And with this, they're building the reef. And corals are animals, so they are not always sessile, they are not always part of the reef, but they have offspring, their juvenile stages or their, their embryo stages and larvae stages that are mobile, so that can get distributed by ocean currents. So corals release their eggs and sperm, which develop into embryos and then further into larvae. And these larvae are yeah, carried by currents until they find a place in the reef where they can settle. And this then develops into a polyp. And a polyp, what you can see here, this little thing with lots of tentacles, that's the actual uh, um, coral. So this is the animal that you see hiding inside these structures. And this primary polyp then develops into a colony, first a juvenile coral colony, and later into adult colonies. And this life cycle is also important to keep in mind when doing restorations. Yeah, there are different restoration methods. And the oldest one, the oldest active one that happened was direct trans transplantation. And it means that pieces or fragments of corals are picked up from one reef and then brought to the site that needs to be restored. So um, yeah, fragments are used from one side and brought to another side. This is only not destructive for the reef, for the donor reef, if uh, fragments that are used are not broken off and then brought to the site that you want to restore because you don't want to do more harm than good. Um, this is only good if you can collect enough healthy fragments that are broken off anyway. So the pros of this technique is that it can be quite a quick response after a damage or after a disturbance. And because you need many helping hands to do this, it's a good, it has a good educational effect. But the cons are outweighing. Um, it, it is very challenging to find a good source of transplantation, a good donor reef, where you find enough fragments that you don't have to break off. It's very labor and cost intensive. It, it's a lot of work. It's often also not promoting diversity because very often always the same species is picked and brought to the new site. So um, the 
one conducting the transplantation is actually selecting which colony is used. And um, it's very difficult in a large scale because you need to remove corals from one place and then put it into a new place. And of course, also when putting the coral onto a new place, you add artificial materials because you either have to tie it with plastic zip ties or use concrete or use uh, underwater glues. So it's all not natural ocean material. Then the next technique that um, builds up on direct transplantation is coral gardening. And it means that corals are transplanted with an intermediate nursery phase. So this is less invasive because the fragments that are used from the donor site are um, yeah, brought further into or broken into further small pieces. And these pieces are cultured at so-called hanging trees or in the lab. So this can be um, in situ or ex situ, so in the ocean or in the lab. And um, once they started growing, they already make a much la larger volume, a much higher biomass, and then they are transplanted into the recipient site. So this has the advantage over direct transplantation that um, you can achieve faster growth because you have smaller fragments and smaller fragments tend to grow faster. It's also a good response after disturbance and also has a good educational effect because you need many hands on. And um, on top of that, it's counteracting population declines because you can restore larger areas. The disadvantage of it as well is that it's quite labor intensive, also high costs. Um, it's also difficult to promote biodiversity here um, because again, you're working with copies of the same colonies. And again, you need these artificial materials, bring them to the reef um, to attach the transplants. But going one step further of that, we come to the so-called microfragmentation method. And this method adds another intermediate step into the whole transplantation process. So here, coral fragments are sawed with diamond blades into much, much smaller pieces. These pieces can be just one square centimeter, two square centimeters big. And uh, researchers who first developed this technique found that corals will grow much, much faster if they are so small. So the overall result of a biomass increase that you get is much, much larger in the same amount of time. So once these micro fragments um, started growing in the lab, then they are moved to uh, it's often bad sea beds in the reef where they can grow to larger size. And from there, they are planted out into the reef. And one of the major advantages of this technique is the really fast growth but also the fact that not only branching species like the ones we've seen before can be used, but also massive coral species can be used. So corals forming boulders and blocks can also be um, transplanted with this technique. It's also counteracting population declines, is a good response after disturbance and has a good educational effect because many people need to get involved. Um, the disadvantage of it is that this is probably the technique that needs most tools and um, it depends on long culturing um, months in the lab also. And again, um, 
it's quite limited in promoting biodiversity unless you already make sure in the lab that you culture a lot of different species. And again, for outplanting, artificial materials are used. Yeah, and then we have one of the oldest techniques. It's the artificial reef techniques. Um, with this technique, um, one of the aims is basically stabilizing substrate. It would make sense if the cause of damage was uh, dynamite fishing, so you have a lot of loose substrate left in the reef, then these artificial structures, like what you see here, metal frames, or often um, yeah, cement is used, cement sculptures, um, then this, this would make sense. What, uh, yeah, it can be combined with also transplanting corals directly onto the substrates, but very often it's just, the structure is just put into the reef and then you wait for uh, corals to settle. And in some areas, I think in, in Bali, it's very common now, uh, it has become popular to put artist, artistic sculptures into the sea and then wait for settlement. The advantage of this is that you directly get a structure that can attract fish. So if the main aim of restoration is increasing fish stocks, uh, attracting fish, then this would, could be good. And also if the aim is stabilizing the substrate, <laughs> if the substrate was too loose. But it has many disadvantages. First of all, it's high material costs using so much steel and or cement. It can change the hydrodynamics of the reef. If it was a reef with soft substrates, um, a sandy reef, yeah, maybe that's also the, the natural way how it should be. And then it's not always good to add solid structures. If um, this restoration attempt, attempt fails, means that corals don't start to settle, then you have these structures in the reef that will be there forever. You won't be able to remove them or most likely won't be able to remove them. So it's also not good for reef aesthetics. And again, you're adding a lot of additional artificial materials here, especially often it's a lot of cement and cement is one of the worst um, drivers of, uh, of climate change. Producing cement creates a lot of CO2, puts a lot of CO2 into the atmosphere. So it should be really be outweighed if this is necessary. It can only be done in small scale. And also it might attract species that you don't want in the reef. It might attract invasive species or anything that settles faster than corals. So it should really be thought through. Yeah, the almost last second last technique that I want to explain is bio rock. And this is almost the same as artificial substrates, but here um, an electric current is applied onto the metal substrates to um, provoke more rapid coral growth. So having this electric current, um, it's usually through a battery, um, will increase skeleton growth in corals. And this was very popular in the 90s and 2000s. And there were many attempts, but there were only, I think it's only two studies that actually found accelerated coral skeleton growth. So the main purpose of, of it is not really proven to work with this technique. And it has many disadvantages. It's really high material costs. Uh, it has all the disadvantages as the artificial structures have. And on top of that, it needs a lot of maintenance and uh, it needs a permanent power supply. 
it might be a bit better if the power supply comes from solar energy of a local source, but um, this really needs to be thought well if the, all the effort is really worth the effect. Yeah, and then we come to the technique that I would like to focus on today, and that's so-called laval enhancement. And this technique uses corals in a different stage, in the lava stage, to provoke uh, restoration. And I would like to show um, you yeah, these two studies. These are studies done by De La Cruz and Harrison in the Philippines. And they use this technique of level enhancement to restore reefs on um, the islands or reef complex Bolinao under and did most of the work in Bolinao Marine Laboratory. They published two, um, two, two studies that were done in the, exactly the same way, but one was done in 2017 with the coral species here, Acropora tenuis, and then the other one was published in 2020 with Acropora laripus. So to remind those who didn't participate last time, Acropora is a coral genus um, that is really common. It's the most common coral genus in the world. And they often form corals that look like these, like branching or tables in the sea. So what the authors did was they established plots in a reef. These plots were six times four meters large. And inside these plots, they attached um, settlement plates that looked like this. And um, these settlement plates were cut from dead coral, from dead table coral. So this is a very suitable substrate to uh, wait for la coral larvae to settle. And then they had some plots um, covered with a mesh and underneath this mesh, they added coral larvae. So first of all, to be able to do that, they needed to collect or they needed to have coral larvae. How do you get coral larvae? One option, and that's what they did, is to check for gravid colonies, so for colonies that were near to spawning, to releasing their eggs and sperm. So they broke off some pieces or small collected small colonies and brought them to a hatchery facility in the lab. At the hatchery facility, they waited for these colonies to spawn. So an alternative to this could be to collect the eggs and sperm directly in the reef with simple uh, egg traps like, like you can see here in the picture. That would be less invasive because you don't have to remove any corals from the reef. Once um, the colony started to, to spawn, they collected the egg and sperm bundles just by fishing them out from the tank and then poured them into a larger container and then checked once the eggs were fertilized, they checked under the microscope for the development of embryos. And then they washed the embryo several times with adding new seawater um, to prevent that there's bacteria that might harm the embryos and then moved the larvae to a few really large tank, thousand liter tanks. And these tanks contained seawater that was filtered with one micrometer filter. So this is something, a filter that you can also get for filtering tap water. So it's quite common, it's easy to get everywhere. And the lava were then kept in these tanks for four days and then um, brought to the reef by re putting them first in large plastic zip bags 
and then um, emptying these zip bags underneath the mesh that they had put into the reef. So what you see here, this net and the mesh, this was keeping the coral larvae at this site until the larvae started to settle. And because this was a scientific study and they wanted to compare the success of settlement, they had three plots, four times six meters with mesh and three plots without mesh. And then after five days, um, they checked how much larvae had settled. And for, this is why they needed these uh, square plates, these settlement plates, because in the natural environment, it's very difficult to see the settling larvae on the early days because they are so small and there's so much other stuff that you can't see it. That's the main purpose of having these plates. So in 2017 with Acropora tenuis, they, after five days, they, found a lot of lava that had settled on the settlement plates where they had the mesh, but none in the control site, so where they didn't have the mesh. And it was really similar, almost the same for Acropora ripis and, um, yeah, a few years later. And also they looked at where the lava had settled on top of the settlement plates, on the bottom sides or on the sides. So this was a bit different between the two species. And um, then they monitored the survival of these settled larvae, these recruits um, for 35 months, so for almost three years. And this is already much longer than most studies that did coral transplantations monitored. So most studies only followed up for 12 months and then didn't check anymore. So it's really important to monitor this for at least three years because that's when corals also become reproductive, become adult. So they saw that the survival was much higher on the natural substrate. So this was below the mesh um, on the natural substrate, but not on the settlement plate. So the survival after a long time on the recruitment tiles on the settlement plates was quite low, but it was really high in the natural reef. And again, also they looked at top, bottom and the sides of the settlement plates and found highest survival for both species on the top. Then um, they looked at the size of juvenile colonies and um, the same again for 35 months and found that there was no difference in size between those corals that were growing on the settlement tiles and those that were growing on the natural substrate. And you can see that the diameter after three years was between 15 centimeters and eight centimeters, depending on the two species. Acropora tenuis was doing much better with this technique and what was growing much faster. So yeah, what they found is that even after three years, there was still good survival on not on the settlement plates, but on the natural reef. And there was a decent growth of corals. So the corals developed into healthy looking um, adult colonies. Or adults they only found in Acropora tenuis and uh, the other species was not reproductive yet. So here in this picture, you can see the stars mark all the colonies that resulted from the lava settlement attempt. And where you see two stars closely together, it means that two of the small colonies in the beginning, they fused to become a big colony, like you can see here also. 
And for Acroporodoripus, they also showed examples in their paper. So on top, you can see, it's probably hard to see what it is here, is the juvenile coral after eight months here on the settlement plate, here on the natural reef. And on the bottom, you find the same colony after three years here on the settlement pile. So also here it looked like a healthy, yeah, good looking coral. Yeah, the pros and cons of this technique, the larval enhancement technique, uh, um, the pros are that it's a relatively low time effort and aftercare. So it's a lot of work in the beginning, but once it's done, you just let it grow. It's, it can be very cost efficient if the materials are reused. The good thing is you don't need permanent supply of cement and uh, steel and so on. You just need the smash. It only stays for five days, then you remove it and you can use it for the next plot. So um, you don't need much materials, but it's an investment in the beginning because you need quite some specific materials in the beginning. This is a technique, technique that can promote diversity because uh, you basically can take a shot. You can take, use different, you can add, use eggs and sperms of different corals or egg bundles of different corals and you can rear the larva together and then just put it onto the reef and see what happens. So it's a more natural process of colonization and there should be more diversity, especially more genetic diversity. And it's the least invasive because you don't need to go and break off pieces of corals or collect corals from somewhere and bring them to a new site, especially if you use the egg collection technique in the reef with egg traps. Um, the main disadvantage of it is that it needs specialized equipment for these initial four or five days where you have to rear the larvae. And you also need um, expert uh, yeah, ideas, or at least um, in the first attempts, you need expert knowledge how to rear the larvae. But I think once this works well, it's a really good technique that allows you to um, you recover large areas of the reef without high costs. Also, um, a disadvantage is that you need to know when the spawning season is. So it's good for areas where a lot of research has been done already. And I think this shows really well what we talked about in the last webinar, how research can really help um, conservation, how research can contribute to conservation. And even what seems like baseline research can be really important for applications later on in conservation. So if we take Banda, for example, we know when the spawning season is, that would be easy to do something like this because you know exactly this day after full moon, we can go put an egg trap. Next day, we have the eggs ready to rear the larvae. Um, yeah, there might be more studies needed with different species to really learn more about the survival rates. And yeah, this will help also to know how efficient this can be. And just to yeah, make an emphasis, put an emphasis again on that coral restoration needs to be planned well. I created a workflow just for this example. Um, so first, you need to ask yourself a lot of questions before you start restoration. And uh, for example, you need to ask yourself, what was the cause of reef degradation? Storms, bleaching, dynamite fishing, nutrients or pollutants or any other of the causes. And in this case, I would check, for example, bleaching. If you checked uh, dynamite fishing, then you would need to ask yourself next, 
has the source of degradation been eliminated or is it still present? But okay, here we select bleaching. This can, for example, be a reef at the Banda Islands that experienced some bleaching in 2020 when the last big El Nino hit the world or hit the Pacific. So are live corals still present would then be the next follow-up questions. And let's stay with the Banda examples. Then I would press yes, because all reefs in Banda still have a high coral cover, even if some suffered under bleaching. So this is just assuming, uh, I also don't know yet about the degree of impact of bleaching. Um, if there are still live corals present, then um, we should think next about the restoration goals. So do I want to revive the reef structure or do I want to maintain biodiversity, increase coral cover, or is my main goal to raise awareness or do I want to protect a certain species or do I want to promote fish aggregation? I just check these two for our example here. So let's say our aim would be to maintain biodiversity and increase coral cover, which makes sense for reefs like Banda that are highly diverse and still have a good coral cover but you might see it going down slightly over the last years. And then we come to the key question if we aim at larval enhancement, are local spawning patterns known? And yes, we know about the spawning peaks because of Andika's nice work that we talked about last year, last week. So in this case, I would suggest to do larval enhancement, maybe in combination with um, coral gardening or even microfragmentation to add more educational aspects, but let's stick with this first. So let's see how it would actually look like to do larval enhancement in Indonesia and what the costs would be. And so I just played around in the internet and almost all the materials that are needed can be found in the Indonesian, um, one of the Indonesian online shops easily. You can order it and send it anywhere in Indonesia. So what is used for the mesh covering for this technique, it's just an organza fabric. This is a fabric that is used as wedding dress fabric cheap, easy to get. To stabilize the mesh, um, the authors in that study that I presented added a nylon net of one millimeter mesh. Same online shop, also quite cheap. Um, and to make sure that it stays firmly on the reef and that no larva can, ex can escape, the authors used small lead weights that were stitched into the edges of the fabric. Again, available and cheap. And I think even in every fishing village, this can be bought. It doesn't need to be ordered online. Plastic zip bags anyway, easy to get. Funnels as egg traps, also easy to get in any kitchen supply shop. Then these famous uh, containers that you can find in Indonesian mandis, bucket showers. So nothing is easier to get than this. This can be used to scoop off the egg bundles. And um, tanks with a bottom outlet that can be used for washing the um, fertilized eggs for removing sp uh, sperm and washing them before the larvae is transferred into the large containers, also available. Then the large tanks, um, of course, can easily get them everywhere and aeration pumps to 
make sure that there's enough oxygen supply. You can even find solar powered pumps. So this is all, these are all materials that are quite non-scientific, not specific and are easily to get. And there's some scientific material that you would need. A stereo microscope should be available in any research facility or in Skolatingi and Banda, for example. Um, so I would assume that it's possible to find access, get access to it. This would be needed to check out health of the embryos and larvae. And then um, devices for filtration of seawater, like I said, there are devices that you can attach to, to taps um, that can be used with filters. This can be used in, on top of, of, of uh, together with a pump, pumping seawater. And then the last thing is a plankton net sea to remove larvae from um, the water and transfer it into the Ziploc bags to bring them to the transplantation site. So all of this is, I think, material that is not too expensive and easy to get. So I did a breakdown of costs um, for four years of conducting this method and conducting transplantations. So with almost yeah, nearly 20 million rupiah or 1,200 euros, you could easily supply eight plots uh, with larvae per year. And if we take the average survival from the publication that I presented, um, it would mean 1.4 colonies per square meter that would result into more than 1,000 healthy colonies in four years. That means just the material cost would only be <clears throat> a little bit more than one euro per colony. This is not calculating um, costs for yeah, divers, dive tanks, and so on. But um, the nice thing with this technique is that you don't have to go back every day and uh, do like thousands of dives. So it's not that high either. So yeah, I'm talking about the, the cost specifically because I think in this frame we have many divers and also we have students from Banda listening today. We have researchers from Banda at, from Skolatingi listening today. So I would say, yeah, why not form a team in Banda that can restore sites that might have suffered under the 2020 bleaching. So I'm specifically thinking about yeah, docents and um, students from Skolatingi, Parikanan Hatasyachir, from Kantor Konservasi in Banda, and of course all the dive guides, dive centers, Ankatan Laut, which is the Navy. So and maybe this all can also communicate with the villagers and get communities more involved. So yeah, maybe based on this webinar, a team might form and I'm happy to give suggestions and to provide expertise with planning these things. But what I want to say yeah, to end this, this session is that none, really none of the restoration techniques that have ever been done or that will be done in future can replace fighting, fighting climate change. Climate change and rising temperatures are the biggest challenge for coral reefs. And um, yeah, we can never ever make up for reducing the speed that climate change happens by conducting coral reef transplantation. So the focus should always be eliminating factors of disturbance and then doing well-planned restorations. So this can really contribute towards saving coral reefs, but it's of course not the only tool and the main focus should be doing everything we can to slow down climate change. I would like to thank you and would like to open for discussions now. 
I apologize that the Indonesian subtitles came up late. Um, I will see that I fixed this in the online video. So we will make this available on YouTube and I will add the Indonesian subtitles to be complete then. Yeah, please. Um, I'm happy to receive questions now. And maybe we can translate every question into Indonesian also, or if there are Indonesian questions, we can translate it into English so that everyone can participate in the same way. <laughs> <laughs> 